All right, in the previous video, we talked about the biosynthesis of glutamate and glutamine. And in this video, we're going to talk about the covalent regulation of glutamine synthetase. Now, to remind you what glutamine synthetase does very briefly, this blue enzyme right here, it's also this reaction right here. It's a two-step process, but glutamine synthetase converts glutamate to glutamine, all right? And it does it through the use of ATP. It phosphorylates glutamate to make a gamma-glutamyl phosphate intermediate, and then ammonia displaces the phosphate to make glutamine, all right? And I mentioned in the previous video that glutamine synthetase is one of the most heavily regulated enzymes because it reacts with ammonia and ammonia is toxic. We need to regulate ammonia levels very, very tightly. And there's a lot of ways we do that. And we'll have a summary video at the very end of amino acid biosynthesis where we'll talk about that because it's also going to lead us into nucleic acid synthesis. But glutamine synthetase is regulated in two ways. First of all, allosterically, which will be the next video, and in this video, covalently. The covalent regulation is actually very complicated, but we'll hopefully try to break it down. This glutamine, this is, these are both glutamine synthetase. However, this in green, sort of dark green, this is the active glutamine synthetase. On the left side, it's inactive. Now, how do we activate glutamine synthetase? Or better yet, a better question, how do we inactivate it? It turns out that glutamine synthetase is inactive when it has an adenosine monophosphate attached to it, or an AMP. The process of attaching an AMP to anything, a molecule, a protein, whatever, is called adenylation. In other words, if I adenylate glutamine synthetase, I inactivate it. It's not going to do the reaction I just showed you right here. If the adenylate group is not there, meaning it's been deadenylated, then glutamine synthetase is active. All right. All right. So let's talk about the progression. Now I'm actually going to start down here at the bottom. It's a little backwards, but let's talk about glutamine synthetase. It turns out that glutamine synthetase, as we just mentioned, is active when deadenylated and inactive when adenylated. Well, what transfers an adenylate group? Well, an adenylyl transferase, all right, which is, leads us to this enzyme, AT. You see this AT at various points here. AT is called adenylyl transferase. Now, this adenylyl transferase is a little bit different, all right. It's different in the sense that it's able to form a complex with this P2 protein. We're not really concerned with that. But suffice to say, the way to think about it simplistically is this adenylyl transferase, when it's in the active state, it acts as an adenylyl transferase. When it is inactive, this complex acts as a hydrolase, meaning it catalyzes the deadenylation. All right? Then we see over here a UT. UT is a uridylyl transferase. It's a tongue twister. A uridylyl group is a UMP group, a, urid a uridine monophosphate, a UMP. So if I have something that adds a UMP group, that is a uridylyl transferase, and that is a uridylylation, okay? If I was to remove the UMP group, it would be a deuridylylation, okay? And that's a hydrolase, all right? So let's talk about this starting with the uridylyl transferase. And we're going to mainly talk about what activates, what activates glutamine synthetase. All right. So a uridylyl transferase catalyzes the transfer of a UMP group. That UMP group comes from UTP. This protein P2, in order to activate glutamine synthetase, this P2 needs to be uridylylated. Okay? Do you see how this P2 has a UMP group on it? Okay? When that P2 has a UMP group on it, it will attach to the adenylyl transferase, but it will cause this complex to act as a hydrolase. Okay? So see, when the P2 with the UMP, uridylylated P2, combines with adenylyl transferase, the complex now acts as a hydrolase, and it deadenylates glutamine synthetase. That makes glutamine synthetase active. All right? However, if for whatever reason the P2 is deuridylylated, meaning it doesn't have a UMP group, it will still combine with adenylyl transferase, but because the P2 protein is not uridylylated, 
Now this complex acts as an adenosyl transferase, not a hydrolase. So it will transfer the adenylyl group onto glutamine synthetase, which inactivates it. All right? And that's good and all, okay. The glutamine synthetase is regulated by adenylation, and protein 2 is regulated by uridylation, but how do you regulate the uridylation? Well, it turns out that this uridylyl transferase, UT, is regulated very tightly, okay? It turns out that, look here, we have these, these green signs and red signs. The red signs are inactivating, and the green signs are activating. It turns out that high levels of alpha-ketoglutarate and ATP stimulate the uridylyl transferase. Because after all, what does the uridylyl transferase do? Through these mechanisms here, it ultimately activates glutamine synthetase. Well, if we have a ton of ATP floating around and a ton of alpha-ketoglutarate, that's high energy charge for the cell. So it's high energy. We don't need all this ATP and alpha-ketoglutarate, so let's put it in another form. If we're high energy charge, let's do biosynthesis. So high alpha-ketoglutarate and ATP stimulate the uridyl transferase, which, remember, high levels of alpha-ketoglutarate and ATP stimulate the uridyl transferase, which add a UMP to P2, which causes the AT complex to act as a hydrolase, which removes the AMP group from glutamine synthetase, making it active. And then we get the conversion of glutamate to glutamine. So that's good. But what happens if we're in a low energy charge of the cell, low energy state? So we have a lot of phosphate around, and we have a lot of glutamine. Well, maybe we want to break the glutamine down. Maybe we want to do catabolism there. So high levels of glutamine and phosphate inhibit the uridylyl transferase, meaning now you have P2 in the deuridylylated state. It doesn't have that UMP. So when it combines with the adenylyl transferase, the adenylyl transferase acts as such, an adenylyl transferase, and it adenylates glutamine synthetase, rendering that enzyme inactive. So if it's inactive, do we get the conversion of glutamate to glutamine? The answer is no. Now the glutamate can be catabolized into alpha-ketoglutarate, which will be used in the TCA cycle. Okay, So in other words, glutamine synthetase is regulated by adenylyl transferase, which is indirectly regulated by a uridylyl transferase, which is regulated allosterically okay, by these four effectors mainly right here. And so the logic is if we have a lot of ATP and a lot of alpha-ketoglutarate floating around, why don't we do biosynthesis? We have plenty of ATP to do it, and we have too much alpha-ketoglutarate, so let's siphon those off and make glutamine. But if we are in low energy, lots of phosphate, and we have plenty of glutamine, well then let's just catabolize it down for energy production. So we won't do glutamine synthetase on glutamate. We'll actually do glutamate dehydrogenase, which will convert glutamate into alpha-ketoglutarate for use in the TCA cycle, okay, for energy production. All right. So the way to think about this covalent regulation logically is, do I need to do biosynthesis because I have plenty of energy around, high energy charge, or do I need to make energy using the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation because I'm low on energy? And then I do the opposite. Okay. So the main thing to remember, what stimulates glutamine synthetase? Activated urodyl transferase and then P2 is uridylylated, and then adenylyl transferase acting as a hydrolase. Deadenylation favors active glutamine synthetase. What favors catabolism, meaning turning off glutamine synthetase? Well, inactive uridylyl transferase and active adenylyl transferase acting as an adenylyl transferase and adenylation of glutamine synthetase, which renders that enzyme inactive. All right, so that is the very powerful covalent regulation of glutamine synthetase, which results from allosteric regulation of the uridylyl transferase right here. Okay, So it's very complicated, but hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, In the next video, we're going to go over the allosteric regulation of glutamine synthetase, and to some extent I think that's a little bit easier to understand. All right, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.